the leisure experiences as we are welcoming two amazing people, people who I am incredibly proud to be introducing um, and so honored to be speaking to today. We will be speaking to Vani Murthy and Manoj Kumar. Both Manoj and Vani bring a unique set of expertise to this subject, and we will be speaking to both of them to understand and learn about micro practices and scalable systems that can help us live well with nature. So quickly, I'd like to introduce each of them. I'll start with, start with Vani. Vani Murthy is known as the queen of compost and, and is an urban farmer. She's a passionate citizen leader and the most active campaigner for solid waste management or SWM. She started her SWM journey in 20, 2008 with the Wealth Out of Waste program and with her Instagram videos on zero waste hacks, which I'm sure all of you have seen, they are remarkable. And composting practices, she has become a, a household name to adopt such sustainable practices in their lives. She was also featured recently by Nachio in the One for Change campaign. So Vani, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you. It's an honor to be on your show. Manoj Kumar, has worked for nearly two decades with Adivasis in the Naxal-affected Arku region, creating functional forests with 3 million trees, including 1 million coffee bushes, which brought 300,000 lives out of poverty and created a globally renowned brand called Arku Coffee. The regenerative agricultural model practiced in Arku is now being popularized around India under the treaties called Arukonomics, for which the Rockefeller Foundation USA awarded Nandi Foundation with the Food System Vision Prize. Manoj is on the pathway to take its transformative potential across the country. And of course, as a consumer of Araku coffee, you know, the, the end result is, you know, you, you never know what the story is behind it, but the story is remarkable. And thank you for that, you know, we look forward to learning about that journey, but thank you so much for joining us here today, Manoj. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful introduction. You you have already won the Araku team and Nandi team's hearts and mine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have lots of hearts to win today, so we'll get, get started. Um, so, Vani, I'd love to, you know, start with you. Would you describe a little bit about your journey towards the low waste lifestyle and composting and particularly how you thought of it as a solution towards Bangalore's waste management problems? Mine goes a very long way back. Uh, I have been a homemaker, hardly did anything outside home. Uh, and uh, of course, when my both, both my boys grew up, uh, I, I went and, uh, you know, started going to the resident welfare association in my area. You know, and, and I'm seeing them doing so much work, projects. I mean, I've never been a part of anything outside home. So it, it was very interesting. And uh, very slowly, I started, you know, taking part. And uh, there is a friend of mine who lives in my neighborhood, Dr. Meenakshi Bharat. Uh, she's uh, kind of uh, pulled me into some projects. And uh, the first project we did was Wealth Out of Waste, uh, which gave me an understanding about the amount of waste that we generate and what happens to it and how it can go for recycling. You know, they were looking at the wealth in the waste that we, we discharge. Uh, and, and, and slowly, I think uh, there was a kind of uh, lovely energy and a lot of people who were already working in the space of waste came together and uh, we formed the Solid Waste Management Roundtable. And I think uh, going to the landfill, visiting the landfill was a turning point for me uh, because I did not want to contribute to that huge mess that we saw and how it was actually uh, creating the problem for the villages there, uh, for the soil, for the air and the water and the groundwater. Uh, and I think I, I somehow made a resolve that I will come back and uh, not contribute to that. So I started looking how I can reduce the amount of waste that I generate. Can I effectively, you know, send it away for recycling, not generate anything that is non-recyclable, and of course, compost my kitchen waste. Uh, so there began the journey, which I think without any stress, without any pressure, it just so organically grew into me becoming uh, more and more conscious of my lifestyle. And that's where the low waste living comes. I mean, we can, there is no uh, standard here. I mean, for each, it is very different. Uh, so it, it is it is that you're contributing every day is the key. 
you know every individual does something if, on a daily basis to say that he's taking action and that that's what i think i i like to project and uh, i share my practices and uh, uh, in in bangalore the swrt team has been very vocal about decentralized waste management and we have worked at different levels uh, to make sure you know uh, we get every citizen to participate in managing the city's waste and saying my waste is my responsibility absolutely that's been a remarkable effort and it really the collaboration aspect of how you brought people together and you mobilized a group a community together to solve our own problems i think that's a very powerful thing to do right it's not just your sort of mission or your challenge to overcome but it really was you you gave purpose to a, a group of people and i think that's really remarkable and i think that is also quite similar in a sense to the arku journey as well and that you know there is this sort of community aspect to it so on that front manoj if you could talk a little bit about you know the fact that you are a social entrepreneur and in sort of creating arku and in that journey um you had a certain purpose of course and a vision behind it if you could just talk a little bit about that and how arku came to be and sort of how you know everything leading up to it and into it yep i'm i'm so excited that um, you preceded it with the compost story because um, in a way almost everything about arconomics revolves around composting and it's about influencing the food system from the soil we call it the soil to foil model so i'm i'm glad that it has been uh, the araku story has been prefaced with um, composting story and we will make the twain meet at some point today um, and thereafter araku i should say started for me in 2000 so that is 22 years ago um, 2000 because that's when i started nandi foundation um, and formally took charge as its ceo and um, araku was very much in the news because of at that time because of heightened naxal activity the then chief minister had survived multiple attempts um at his on his life by the naxals in different parts of andhra pradesh and it was very common to hear stories about mobile towers uh being blown up and um, nobody should go in a white car uh because it will be seen as government and blown up so there were so many stories floating around it was it was a bad area that apart frankly i had not known much about that region and only out of academic interest when we went to search we realized that it had the highest maternal mortality rate in the country in fact worse than sub saharan africa almost every woman there died during childbirth because they used uh, rusted arrows to cut the umbilical cord and the placenta and there was septicemia and there was mortality rates high they didn't believe on in trade trained birth attendants attending to this in the conventional way we do it now so that was a challenge um it was completely you know a transition economy if you want to call it barter was very strong and there were still hunter food gatherers in many parts and uh, doing a bit of shifting cultivation so it it was at the 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 region was in a flux and i remember we deciding you know particularly in a conversation my chairman at that time dr reddy um telling me that manoj you should we should probably take up araku as a transformation challenge because it's so huge a challenge that um people will forgive us and you in particular if you fail so that was the biggest advantage that i got which is a kind of um a headline that this is a project where i don't have to worry if i fail because it looked too uh, impossible to uh, succeed there and truly enough when i went there it was absolutely gorgeous place you know if if uh from tamara to mahindra club holidays to the taj group to name whichever i would have invited all of you to set up uh, sustainable resorts there but for the fact that that wonderful place does not by law allow private uh, investments of any kind uh, and so it was untouched unspoiled completely part of the eastern ghats except that the beauty was a facade to extreme poverty in fact 
um, a journalist friend of mine described it best 20 years ago to me that my God, she had come with me and she said, this is a place that's falling off the map. And uh, I think so. When I look back, that was the best description. Uh, and particularly when in a remote village in Pettabailu, uh, which is one very remote uh, place in Mandal in Araku uh, region, where one of the community uh, in 2001, when I had a long discussion at the end of it, a woman got up and asked me uh, in, in her dialect, which I understood, which was part Odia and somebody translated to me. Her question was that by any chance, if I came from India and I said, okay, yes, ah, okay, heard of you guys, you know, uh, and, and you, many of them come here, take stuff from us and just disappear. Uh, you seem to be a nice guy from India though. Um, so it's, it's, it's so remote um, and it, it was so remote that it was in a way intimidating. But what was touching is un, unconditional love. They didn't care. Unconditional trust. Uh, and I think these two became the pillars of this mad journey. I, I'll stop for now to say with the last comment, given that it's World Environment Day, what was really saddening at that time was um, it was really not just receding hairline, as we say, but it was really disappearing trees that you saw there. Um, that entire Eastern Guards and people started telling me that 50 years ago, this was not how it was. Um, trees had disappeared. They, these were people who lived off the forest, by the forest and lived with the forest. Uh, and they said they, they are forced to move uh, to figure out how to produce food from being supported by the forest. And, and these were big lessons in ecology that I learned at that time. And um, that, that was probably uh, the additional takeaway along with poverty that I had to do in those days. And then the journey began um, and started with maternal mortality rate reduction. Uh, and then putting all the children in school because nobody was in school. Um, and of course, the challenges of answering, why should anyone go to school? Since what was taught in school, they told me, was of no relevance to living in forest skills. And I totally realized that it didn't matter when Akbar ruled India, as long as it did not help them to figure out the name of two plants. And so there, it was very challenging to convince them. And so we had to develop curriculum, which was ecology driven. Uh, you know, songs and dance driven, physical activity driven, um, maths that made sense for them and so on. Um, so uh, I think they taught me a lot and taught us a lot rather than we teaching them. Um, and it's in that journey over time, they told us that, is there any way we can not be poor anymore? And that was the biggest economic lesson I finally got because I assumed they were referring about money uh, till they clarified they were referring about biodiversity and that they were referring about trees, uh, flora, fauna, and whatever else they missed uh, because it was just silver oak trees and some old mango trees and n number of jackfruit trees. And that was it. They taught me, taught me that, and all of us, that um, wealth can only mean uh, biodiversity. I mean, they had their own ways of describing it. It's easier for the viewers to know biodiversity as what they meant. Um, and I realized that uh, they, they were not understanding plantations. They were not understanding orchards. Um, and because I should highlight this big thing about the place, which is, they did not have boundaries and they did not have private property. So it was very complex. There, were, there was no separation between them and the planet, them and the forest, them and the trees, them and the animals. Um, so from that background to teach our profit-driven, excellence-driven, you know, surplus generation model of economics, was actually a battle with my own uh, conscience. That's the way I'll start now and leave. 
we can unravel if there are related questions later. Let me pause now. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. You know, it's interesting how like innovation comes out of such challenges, right? Like real, like, I mean, these are real deep challenges that you're talking about because you're talking about behavioral challenges, which I think are sometimes the hardest to get over, but then also the fact that you had, you know, so many pressures and, um, you know, so many different things sort of leading in on this, right? Other it, probably industries and people wanting to sort of take advantage of this community and that ecosystem, and then also like from inside, right, to um, the the desires that they had for their own space. So it's, it's interesting. Vani, from in that perspective, you know, you were also fa faced with numerous challenges. And through that, you started doing a lot of trial and error. You tried, you started experimenting. Um, in order to find viable ways to compost and you know solutions and to manage household waste. So could you tell us a little bit about that part of your journey, right? What were some of the attempts that you made into this? What are the, some of the sources that you learned from? Um, and how did your practice evolve through facing, you know, just you know, through facing those initial challenges and then discovering new ones as you as you went forward? Yeah, right, right. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, I, I had decided, I had made a choice uh, not to send my 60% uh, of the waste from my kitchen uh, uh, to, to wherever it goes. Uh, so since I had made the choice, I had to learn how to compost. And I was introduced to compost. Uh, you, you had talked to uh, Poonam the other day. Uh, I mean, Kamba is my first love, I call it, because uh, I got my first composter from Daily Dump. And uh, uh, so it, it was like in the beginning, um, uh, it it was I I just couldn't get it right so I would say that I failed my first attempt but I'm so glad I did because that's what taught me uh, it taught me everything that I needed to know uh, to have know the art of composting I in fact even till today I am not interested in the science behind the composting at all uh, you know uh, I, I don't need any education on what really happens I'm just mimicking nature in in my own home and. Uh, experimenting with composting was the most exciting thing that I have had in my life. Uh, so it, it was a, a constant understanding of what goes on, you know, uh, how, how does, uh, and by then people started, a lot of vendors started, you know, introducing new kinds of uh, composting systems for an individual home. And uh, they would send me uh, a set and I would try with that. So I tried the Bokashi, the anaerobic composting, uh, and then, uh, of course, the aerobic ones, uh, hot favorite amongst everyone. And uh, the worms, you know, the earthworm composting, the wormy composting was something that was so magical because uh, these tiny things, they keep, you know, feeding on the food that you give them. As long as you give them the lo lovely right environment, they are doing such an amazing job by, you know, you're just looking for the castings. That is what they eat and what they discharge is what you're looking for. Because I learned that, that is the richest source in soil for plants to feed on. You know, the nutrients come from there. And so just understanding this without even having an education, I, I don't read books at all, uh, to be very frank. So it is more meeting people, you know, learning from them, from their experience. I met Dr. Vishwanath, uh, who is no more. Uh, you know, he, he, he was the one who introduced, uh, uh, you know, organic terrace gardening in Bangalore. And uh, uh, so he... Uh, I then met him and, you know, we, I saw all these urban farmers. So it was like uh, more and more I talk about composting, the more and more I want to experiment with different types. So finally, I realized one thing. Uh, composting is just an experience. It's a learning experience. It's not like uh, you, you can get it right or you don't get it right. And then uh, you, you pull the shutters down saying that it's not for me. Because people, when they open up their minds, you 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 just embrace this natural the most natural thing that's happening in the outside in your own home and that's the connect that I want people to have so my constant endeavor is to make people fall in love uh, to bring those things that's closer to home which you're so disconnected with people are disconnected with soil they, they don't even know that the vegetables and the fruits that they buy in the supermarket is so toxic with so much of pesticides and so people don't see connect at all. They don't see what is naturally in a cycle. They, they love to go to 
lovely places like how you all set up in you know in forest areas and you know it's in the hilly areas where everything is so uh, in that in nature in, in the best way and and people love that but when they come home they are completely disconnected and what's happening there everything is intact it is it is the environment that is you know the cycle is maintained things that fall off the trees is not swept off and burnt you know here in in, in urban spaces you if you see leaves around dry leaves you think they are all kind of uh, you know garbage that you need to sweep and give it off to the municipality or you just take it to one corner and you burn them up in in nature everything is taken back into the soil you know the nutrients are, are formed there with the millions of microorganisms the life thriving life under your feet is the one that is buzzing the energy there and just understanding this itself was so exciting for me that i make sure I tell people to make the choice the right way to compost because if you make the choice because someone told you or you saw someone or a baby on world environment day this is the thing that people are telling compost it won't work for you so you need to compost for the right reason and you you first of all you're holding back great resource from getting lost and polluting environment it's like a double thing but the same thing you're holding back at the at the at the most easiest uh uh, uh you know uh, portion to manage because once you load on to the municipalities it's like 3 4000 tons no municipality can take care of it but when you hold it back it's the smallest portion it is like 1 kg a day of kitchen waste that you can manage at your home and it won't take you i keep telling people uh, even maggi that horrible maggi that we eat uh, you know it doesn't give you nutrients it takes 2 minutes it's sold that in 2 minutes you can make your food but here i will i will want to sell something that in less than a minute you can put it into your compost bin just bring your waste you know kitchen waste put some dry leaves you know put some accelerator which you can even find at home if to get cow dung is great but today you have vendors who have coming up with so many microbes the browns and all that so i feel that excitement in a process just lets you start experimenting and you evolve with the kind of team that i have it's constant you know uh, uh, getting inspired by them uh, and each of us trying to up our game you know the bar is raised and it it is so much fun to be in such spaces and uh, i think that's where i have evolved to be who i am today uh, it it has given me a purpose in life uh, it's made me the happiest i think this is the happiest phase of my life that i am in now uh, because i have constant feedback on you know whatever i put out there are people i get so much love from people so uh, 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 i believe composting is an exp- experiment exp- experiential learning uh you have to experiment with composting no matter what it will turn out right but there will be things that it's going to teach you because you you still haven't got a hang of it so let nature teach you uh, what's best for it and uh, bring that closer to your home i mean that that's what i have learned that you need to create this ecosystem within your home you need to have plants you need the butterflies you need the birds the monkeys keep coming in fact i have a stick with me because if they come i don't want them to disturb my time here otherwise the the terraces for them you know they can eat the tomatoes and they can you know eat the figs and i'm okay with them so it's like live and let live and the compost pile is buzzing with life it's 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 ecosystem in itself then people get scared of bugs and you know they say there are maggots in it i just try to make them comfortable you know you can't be in nature and not want certain things you know you go to a forest you want to go on a safari and there is some bug that's between you or some ant that's climbing you you can't want to be there and not have all these around so you need to be a part of nature you know you need to be part of uh, this beautiful environment that only this planet gives us you know and 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 when you get that passion into you you do anything to make her thrive you would make her you know healthy because our health depends on her health uh so uh, i think that that's the uh, i mean the takeaway is that this this is something that keeps me alive keeps me energetic so composting is that one thing that uh, gave me access to clean, clean food safe food i started growing my food and this is what real food is you know i started sourcing food that is healthy for me and my family so i i'm i'm somewhere trying to close the loop within my home and uh, within my you know the needs that i have I love that concept of you know nature exists right nature exists in in beautiful places like the Arakul Valley like in in Kurg in so many parts of our country but to bring that closer to you and I think there are so many benefits to that beyond I mean of course there's a planetary benefit to it 
but the emotional benefit that you get for yourself, like clearly the joy that it produces for yourself and for others who are doing it at home, like that's really beautiful. Like we don't, you know, and especially in urban areas where there's so much stress and anxiety and all of these other things, the benefit of having nature being a part of your daily routine, not even just like, you know, around you, but part of your routine, I think that's a very, um, it's a really interesting way to think about even like self-care, right? And like why, you know, gardening, for instance, has always been something really, you know, something which is considered very relaxing. Like this almost is like an extension of that to say that, you know, if with composting, you're not just sort of nurturing something upwards, but you're taking what, you know, is considered waste, like you said, and actually regenerating that. And I think that, you know, Manoj, coming back to sort of your journey um, in that way, you know, you were talking about, you know, the, the challenges that you had and sort of the challenges that you were facing from within, from outside, behavioral changes that were required. Could you talk a little bit about um, the model that you finally did create and then implement and then how you ensured that those models were sustained? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not now going into the our economics model, but I'm talking about how we could succeed in the Araku region. Um, and I, I should put on record a couple of disclaimers, which I will repeat, which were our constraints as well as um, non-negotiable conditions. One is, as I said, there was no private property and there was also no boundary. Um, which meant that the rule of the land, and this is a special um, region in India where the tribal law says that each tribal family um, doesn't own any property, but can choose any amount of land which that family is willing to till um, and look after if you're not tilling also. And that becomes your property. That's the idea. You cannot mortgage, you cannot sell. Uh, and in a way, you don't even inherit uh, or bequeath, therefore. Uh, honestly, I think that should be how the whole world should be. But uh, that's for another day. Um, but when you have a population like this, it was very important for us to understand that amazingly, they were all contented and had a very clear definition of how much they are custodians of Earth. So there was this concept of what was their land, which they grew either for uh, grazing their animals or letting them to be around or for their food security. Very much anything else beyond that was actually the commons and they would look after it together. This was the system there. So for me to go and introduce the idea that now can you all take a half acre or one acre of area for coffee as a mini estate was something that they just couldn't understand uh, to start with. And they, they really didn't understand that why it has to be protected. For example, my biggest challenge was early mortality of coffee saplings because they would let the goats eat. And I would have long debates with them and they would say that the plant belongs to both them and the goat. Uh, and I said, but this doesn't work that way you need. So from there, to bring about the concept of if we need to get the forest back, which was the idea of wealth for them, I said, we need to know how to protect these. And I said, the coffee would be juxtaposed with biodiversity by us. We will have shade trees. We'll then bring pepper. And then I said, we can create a, a food orchard, which is basically fruit trees adjacent to the coffee because you can't have coffee with multiple, as you know it better, in the Kurg area, et cetera, also we can't, it has to be a standalone. So I said, we will create the ecosystem to be biodiverse while the micro plot of coffee will remain predominantly coffee, shade tree and pepper. So introducing them to this garden concept or estate concept from a forest was in a way kind of homeopathic reduction in their mindset. Um, but that was essential to bring them to excellence because in, in, in the kind of coffee that we were trying to create for them, they had to look after each bush, they had to look after each stem, they had to look, they have to cherry pick each of the cherries. So this transition from 
just being wanderers and food gatherers in forest and just harmonious existence to tend to and look after 300, 400 to 2000 bushes as the family capacity permits um, on a daily routine basis required a tough transition. The second was that I was competing with classic political economy and developmental challenges of instant gratification as a reward for anything. So I would give you something as a money or as a gift through some scheme or the other, you don't have to really work. Um, even the Narega, which is, which is you know, frankly, uh, a fantastic scheme by design in, in areas which are very hard, which have very harsh weather conditions and existing poverty. Um, but in a place like Araku, for example, it was basically telling them at early days, I remember, you dig a trench in the morning, fill it up in the evening, you get Narega wages. You know, and so they would, they were beginning to be introduced to getting 250 rupees or 200 rupees, which was like suddenly cash economy instantly. And here was I telling them, look after coffee plantations, as you know, for seven years, and, and then you will get income. Um, this was this was a big challenge too, to to shift them to tell to, to the fact that raising a forest is a generation's work and it will be the next generation that will benefit, uh, which is I told them was what they taught us. And now, but they were being caught between the government schemes and the way we all created instant gratification solutions um, to win votes or have plans for five years. So that was really another challenge to manage. And our only technique was to use their own philosophies. So one philosophy they've had was that they believed in being extremely inclusive. So I could not, while I told them to cherry pick the best red cherries, I couldn't cherry pick farmers or families. I had to go to the community and say that each and every one of them are part of this project. Now, this was really tough. It was like telling that anybody in the Mohalla is part of the cricket team of the street. And then, you know, you end up getting a bad team. You don't pick the best team. So this was very much like that. But that was a fascinating challenge because they were so used to it culturally that you don't select some just because they, they happen to be hardworking. It had a corollary challenge too, which is they told me that irrespective of how each one tended to the crop, I had to pay them the same price for the coffee. But this was even more tough because we told that the better the coffee, better the price. And they said, no, that doesn't work because we all put the same amount of time. Um, so it took a while to convince them. And the technique I adopted or we all came up with was to tell that we will bear all the costs of production. And frankly, the only cost of production for us was composting uh, to distribute uh, unlike um, Waniji's case, I was blessed to have a team of agronomists and scientists and engineers, a lot of them with Bangalore connection and the Balani Hills connection, who, who went into the science of microbial world and very detailed could tell how to make a compost far better than just another compost. And, and they went into borrowing stuff from say biodynamics of Stainer to other systems of agriculture and they could make a, a plot of a, a, a patch of soil around the bush so sort of uh, nutritious and nutrient dense that it could do magic to that bush provided it had a biodiversity to support it so this the science of microbiology is all that we have to spend money on and and the bushes of course and the tree saplings that we needed they did the labor and they saw dramatic changes happening to the trees, the growth, uh, the lack of any pests, and, and just there was happiness in nature to a level that they could relate to. And I think that's where we introduced the concept of giving prices to the best village for the best coffee rather than to one farm. And this they could relate to. Um, so that was one behavioral change technique we did. The second was, to tell that we will give, since we do not have any costs for them, the price that we decide will be far more than the New York commodities organic coffee price. We'll put higher than that, including fair trade premium. And 
Once that is agreed, I said that was the base price for everyone. Then I said, however, if they follow all the 19 steps that the coffee experts from around the world, from seed to processing and roasting, were followed, especially in the agriculture, we said, then we will give three times the price for such farmers. So there was a lot of negotiation, but they agreed that it was a fair deal because the, the base price was so high um, that it makes sense. So just to give you a sense, if the Kushal Nagar auction price was 100 rupees for the coffee, clean coffee, um, we started off by telling it will be 200 that you will get. But you will go up to 400 if you follow the 19 practices and if your coffee when cupped by a jury in in Portland gets 85 out of 100, then you're 400 and plus. So this I'm using approximate maths to tell that's kind of the ratios we are talking. That really helped. So unwittingly, I'm sorry, I plead guilty that they became entrepreneurial. They got excited by profits. Um, they liked the idea of uh, celebrating excellence, uh, yet we protected their community spirit. So in a sense, this was the challenge that how can you take um, everyone in a journey of excellence? Because if you understand the coffee market, the highest coffee prices come from micro lots, say in a Rigichafe in Ethiopia or somewhere else in Rwanda, but that is like two bags of coffee in a small patch of land because it's att attended to in every STEMS case by the family. To take it around to... 20,000 acres, that's, that was a challenge. But we could do it because it was 20,000 individual plots. What I would like to conclude is by saying that because of the unique nature of aggregating both the philosophy of excellence through individual families and the idea of biodiversity by adding up individual families' responsibilities, we could, we could bring in the, the, the good aspects of capitalist economy into a very community oriented uh, part of the planet that we were not aware of otherwise. So marrying these two um, economic models was what, which was a real uh, fascinating mind game for us. And then, and it worked because we did not, we ticked every box that mattered to them. And we introduced every box that mattered to us in a, in a manner that, well, we sort of outwitted them if you want to say that way. So um, today, I'm happy to say that we are in close to 1,600 villages. More than 98% of the population in these villages are coffee growers and forest growers. That's why we have like 31 million trees. I mean, three crore trees, yours truly hasn't planted even one. I'm, I think I planted one. Um, so, but I take credit for the fact that we all together managed to do 31 million, which is 3.1 crore. This monsoon, we'll be doing another, I think, 3 million, 1.5 million, 1.5 million. It's important to note there is no irrigation, no borewell has been dug, there is no canal, there is no sprinkler, there is no drip, there is no river water diverted. It's pure rainfall water and the power of composting and the power of mulching and water retention in the soil by which now the organic matter is probably the highest in anywhere in the world and water tables have come up of course 15 years helped so the story there is to show that you can transform a rain fed almost soilless area uh, by just hanging in there and composting and composting and mulching and bringing biodiversity that's a long answer but then for them it's for a the great private, answer let's 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 give it to them it's a great answer. And I think what you really, what I really um, take away from this is really the power of people, right? Because that transformation that you did in that region is because of all of those people, them buying into what you're telling them and what you're telling them is possible because that's, it's not easy, right? To think, okay, seven years from now, this is what's going to happen, but I need to follow these steps. That's, um, you know, credit to them because you know they actually were willing to learn and empower themselves but then the power of those people to actually do that come together and do that is amazing and I think that that we also see that in in so many ways right when we talk about activism and community initiatives and so 
Vani, I think just coming back to you, I mean, we are in currently a state of climate emergency and we really need to start, you know, just catalyzing a lot more in terms of um, eco-conscious practices and, you know, using the power of people really to ensure that we start facing this more proactively. What are some of the viable ways that you've seen individuals and community-driven initiatives contributing to scalable change? And have you have you heard of corporations also engaging with local sk- stakeholders to, to make these types of initiatives successful? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I see more and more corporates reaching out to us, you know, to uh, give them sessions on what individuals can do. Because as a corporate, they are, they are doing something about tree planting or, you know, they take up so many activities, CSR activities, but what can an individual do, you know, uh, at home? Uh, what are the lifestyle changes they can have? So we, especially during pandemic, we have done so many sessions uh, with corporate. Uh, that's one thing. And second thing, uh, community, uh, absolutely, uh, because uh, we have seen it in, in, in all these years that we've been together. Uh, uh, firstly, we went uh, with a PIL, uh, joint PIL, uh, to the court to get uh, segregation mandated for the city of Bangalore. Uh, and uh, once that happened, it was about getting more and more people to take, take it across. So we had citizen mm-hmm. leaders in communities where uh, it, it was uh, so, uh, uh, you know, so easily they could convert people, put all the checks and balances and get everybody to segregate, you know, zero tolerance to mixed ways. So it was citizens who were driving the program uh, of uh, segregation uh, at source uh, in apartments, in communities. Uh, and uh, we, we saw uh, it, it did very well as long as you had a citizen leader who understood the importance of uh, the decentralized waste management. Uh, we were talking about holding back resources and diverting it away from it being mixed and getting polluted. It, it does get dumped up, uh, dumped, uh, and working against all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, like mafias. And, you know, you have all these other uh, invested people who don't want, uh, you know, you to uh, have uh, decentralized. They just want uh, the whole budget goes to trans transporting they want to take it out of the city then the number of tons is what is important for them they don't care if it is mixed or segregated you know so uh, up against that most communities try to but the enforcement was lacking uh, but at the same time we also set up models uh, we came up with uh, campaigns which helped people to understand things better so the two in one bag was our first campaign we talked about segregation color coded and the second campaign was swachagraha I mean, that's one of the most important and most exciting, uh, you know, uh, campaign that we rolled out. And that talked about uh, each home having three green spots in their homes. One is to compost their kitchen waste. Second is to grow something from that. Even just, you know, even the smallest balcony, you you grow your food, you, you grow tomatoes or you grow your greens. And then the third thing, the most vital thing is, have, you know, what comes onto your dining table should be safe for you to eat. So the concept was kind of to introduce people to stay healthy at the same time, keep the planet healthy by keeping away that amazing resource and putting it back where it belongs. It belongs to the soil. Uh, so we also uh, set up models like HSR layout. Uh, uh, we have the citizens there uh, who, uh, along with the elected representatives, came together and they converted a park into a, a complete waste management biodiversity thing. In a sense, uh, we had every uh, uh, community composting models uh, in display, which is a working model where like 600 tons of uh, every day, the waste around that area would come there and they would feed all these composters. Plus so many, uh, you know, individual single household models were there. So the people can come there, plus the entire community, uh, you know, work together. They grow food there. You know, they have the cows there. They have these nuts, uh, you know, desi cows there. And uh, they use the cow dung products there. Uh, and also, you know, uh, they have the vermicomposting. And so the whole ecosystem around, uh, you know, compost, soil building and growing food. So it is, we call it the learning center because we need people to come see, touch and feel. Otherwise, you don't understand composting. So uh, so people come there, thousands of people uh, come there. Uh, it's called the Swachagraha. Kalika Kendra, that is, it's a learning center. And that got replicated in Telangana, you know, in Siddipet. And there the minister uh, was very proactive and he's taken it over. So one of our volunteers, Shanti, Dr. Shanti, she gave up her, you know, her dental practice 
to dive right into this and you know transform communities uh, so we have uh, superheroes in our team uh, and in, in and in this space in bangalore and i see it all over india now uh, that who are working towards getting more and more communities to be involved because ultimately it is our action we cannot ask you know uh, things that is not somewhere related to us you know you can't say take away all the planet, uh, plastic get companies to be responsible ask them to put eco friendly packaging and all, all those things are there i mean we have to work at a different level for the uh, uh, you know extended producers liability but but the fact remains that communities can come together build a strong uh, you know kind of uh, teams that that believe in this you know that's the most important you believe this is one planet and this planet needs us to take action every day and every day we eat our food and there's so much of food waste that goes out so we start looking at how we can live a sustainable path when you talk about a sustainable path you pick up practices and you practice them to the rest of your life it is not like it is like a trend now i i i i do things with other people and then i forget it and i go home and it's not it's not done it's not that so we need people to be deeply understand the you know the intensity of what the impact of our action you know when we throw trash out we over consume with all the uh, you know single use commodities and kind of toxic materials that we put out right from our home cleaners to anything there needs to be a change in the society a mindset change to accept these and that happens only when people are passionately involved you get leaders who passionately talk about it and i i don't even believe that you you need to convert anybody or tell people or convince people your passion will translate into action you know there are people who would want to feel the same what you feel so we have such uh, such kind of uh, uh, movement going on i would call it a movement uh, and uh, it, it's great to see uh, action all over we also co- have a swachhagraha co- compost connect because every apartment like uh, if they are generating more than 100 kg so Uh, you know organic waste they have to have in house composting so they generate compost for their landscape they use and there's so much of extra left so we uh, so there was a uh, you know new uh, campaign called the uh, swachhagraha compost connect where the farmers come and pick up city compost uh, we say that what is uh, what is been uh, you know created in this particular apartment is good because process is the right process because there are things called the 24 hour composting machines that have come Uh, in 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 i mean they have been sold like crazy they they don't make compost they just burn they burn the wet waste of using so much of electricity and it is it is so unsustainable and no compost can happen in 24 hours i'm sure manoj kumar will tell that you know it is a natural process it has a breakdown time and there is so much involved you know it's such the process involves such amazing uh, uh, you know uh, uh, different stages so uh, uh, we we we, uh, we say that yes this apartment is doing the right way uh, and then they come the farmers come and pick it up uh, we told people that they cannot sell it like, exorbitantly it has to, we have a cut off price and this is what they bring the labor and the you know the tractor and they take it back so somewhere you know we are trying to uh, close the you know close that cycle there and put it back uh so yeah and also we have the circular economy where we're looking at the waste pickers and how they can be integrated and how how important it is uh, to recognize that they are the heroes they understand waste better than any of us because they have been picking waste in in the corner of the road they're picking up recyclables which they found value they would sell in the livelihood is because of that so it is important to give them a proper dignity Uh, so we uh, since uh, since the court mandated uh, court also mandated that every ward should have a, a, a driveways collection center and these driveways collection center were managed by these waste pickers and today they are no more waste pickers they are waste managers so you take your waste you don't dump them on the road you take it to the way to the uh, driveway uh, driveways pickers recycling center they sort it they grade it and they create more value in the waste that you are throwing Uh, so it is that circular economy it is in, you know bringing them into a in, from informal sector to formal sector so a lot of uh, things uh, you know around waste itself can happen such positive things can happen that's amazing i and i really like the point that you're saying about creating economic change for people and bringing dignity to their livelihoods because that is something which is so important i feel you know for is in especially in indian society right that, that that transformation does really need to happen because 
as you said, the, uh, you know, you call it the, the waste to wealth. You know, it is how you, what your perspective is on it, right? And to therefore say that there are people who are part of that process and they deserve the dignity and that you're able to be inclusive with so many stakeholders, um, that's truly transformational. Um, Manoj, you know, we've spoken um, a lot about individuals and their um, impact and their, their potential for impact. Now that you've sort of been through this journey for a while, and um, we know that, for instance, in India, especially with our growing population, we have a huge dependence on agricultural communities um, and rural communities. What do you think are some of the ways in which industries, you know, especially industries like hospitality, for instance, which are heavy consumers, heavy wasters also, how do you find that we could be uh, addressing the kind of impact that our industry has on issues of climate change, um, especially in consideration of agrarian regions and communities? Yeah, that's, I think that's the question for this century for us. Um, and and it, it should spread across to everyone, every individual who consumes food, because I will relate the answer around food. And that's that's been our main sort of appeal. Um, the this is one thing um, like air and water, maybe food, which everyone is involved. I mean, so I always tell that sustainability and climate change battles, uh, the only people exempted are those who don't consume food. Uh, because food is such a powerful um, force to change the, the way we can address sustainability and climate change. So especially in industries in the hospitality or the food and beverages industry, I think should take a lead in um, asking people or helping people, consumers, to ask questions about food to start with. And I always say, and this is the oversimplified crux of the economic treatise, which one is the price, which is the mnemonic we have is PQR. You know, how can we ensure that every time you eat food, uh, you can ask the question, uh, the person who produced food, has that person or the family been profitable or is that family loss making? I think if we, how, how terrible is it to eat food in the morning or afternoon or night and be told that the person who produced this food is actually about to commit suicide? Uh, how terrible is it? But that's the reality. 85% of the world's malnourished children, their parents are farmers or work in the agriculture sector. What an irony that people who produce and put food on our table, they cannot feed their children. So there is a serious problem with the economics of agriculture. So we need to ask this question, how can we make food profitable for the for our food be profitable, guaranteeing profits for the farmer? One of the easy techniques is to go local. I mean, do we really need to import avocado from Spain? I mean, really, really. I mean, you have it in Polony Hills. I grow it in Araku. You can even grow it in your terrace. I'm not making a judgment on importing, but frankly, it is a judgment too, because it's the times that we live. Uh, maybe we had this luxury during the time of Columbus, or I don't know who, who could cart things and come because the world was different. Not anymore. So we need to promote grow local produce local, eat local as far as possible. And there was a reason. I mean, we, we, had, we, were, we had food systems that was very conducive to our health and agroclimatic conditions. And that was what was to nourish and protect us. So if you, if you ignore that and introduce new food systems, which are often monoculture driven and full of um, invisibles, it's not going to help you. So that was one part of the P. The second was to really ask the question that are we able to feed people food that is nutritious. The Q stands for that quality. And how do we promote knowledge around that? You know, uh, it, 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 it just cannot be taste. Uh, can it be little more? And that's another challenge we need to do. And the third is about regenerativeness. You know, let's, can we end this terminal form of agriculture? One seed, one crop, one season, you know, come on. I mean, that's not us. So we were, we were meant to be regenerative. 
I mean, the whole theory of evolution is to be regenerative and we cannot reduce it to terminal just because it helps profits. So if every consumer is going to ask every restaurant and every cafe these three questions before eating and say that we are willing to pay you more, I'll pay more to stay in Tamara leisure experiences if you promise me PQR, I think that's the best time when people are really enlightened. And that's the challenge. And, and an extension, I will say, we all should see how to address regions where we can help promote forests. I mean, we have an obsession uh, as my journal, another friend, photographer friend always teases me, India is the land of statues. He says there are a billion people and a billion statues of leaders. You know, if instead of that, we had just trees, it would have been fascinating. So I think every one of us can promote trees and forests as a main social responsibility, we will have a different world. So those are some of the very simplified things. I mean, I, I would, I, I can't resist saying that in Bangalore, in Indira Nagar, we have our Araku Cafe. We tell the team that the only conversation you should ever have is to these topics with consumers, if at all, which is to talk about PQR, not because it's us, but to promote it in a manner that people, we, we should, everyone who eats should become an activist to protect the planet. And, and food has that power to unite us. Let's, let's do that. I mean, yeah, I think I, you know, food and sort of the, you know, the way that it connects people and you know, the, the way it's sort of a universal language, right? When you think about food in a way and everyone has this sort of desire to be a part of that story. Um, one of the things that, you know, you mentioned about Eat Local, one of the trends which has been sort of coming up more, I mean, recently, and I've seen more recently in India than I have seen in other places is this concept of farm to table. So where the farm is close by or you have a restaurant on a farm, um, and that's where most of your produce is coming from in order to sustain, uh, you know, the, the, whatever the restaurant is producing. Um, in our properties, actually in Tamara, uh, most of our properties actually have some sort of local farming. So even our Bangalore and Trivandrum city hotels, there is actually some amount of farming which happens on the building itself or right next to the building on a plot of land. So it's amazing because it is not some, it, 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 there's so many benefits. One is that of course you get the quality of the produce you have, you know, you control the input, you're um, able to produce really beautiful you know, produce on itself. The other thing which is really interesting is that we've seen that it is something which really brings the team together, the staff together in being able to do that, right? Because there is sort of this very, fulfilling feeling that you get for for being part of that journey of the produce which is then served to the guests you know who come into our restaurant and it's a story that we're able to tell and it's very um you know just it, it's an incredibly powerful one and so um so yeah so, we, i mean it's should, it's a journey we, yeah I, yeah appeal that try to and you you are the best person i can say to um we should we should ensure it's also regenerative and avoid absolutely and pesticides because that's also a way to protect so yeah so and I'm right sure exactly that in Tamra. all of our produce is organic but yes i mean there's always more to do we have these lovely cows in kurg as well who are part of our entire ecosystem there and um but yeah and but you know I, but there, it's always a learning journey i think and in hospitality and in other industries as well I think, you know, there are practices which are becoming more and more commonplace, which are becoming, um, you know, which are experimentative and sort of proving that, hey, it can be done this way, it can be done that way, particularly in waste management. So, you know, Vani, just last question, I think we've, you know, pretty much come to the end and we've run out of time, but I would love to know from you as well, are there any emerging trends you're seeing in household waste management that you could share with us, things that we could possibly do on our own? Um trends I, I think uh, uh, more and more people are opting for they want some help to understand uh, you know how to do it so uh, you know, the, the, the communities are adopting waste management you know segregation being the key uh, there, there are training sessions for housekeeping that helps a lot in having zero tolerance uh, so it, it's been part it's been evolving uh, more than trending uh, it's, uh, I think there are a lot of challenges at the same time. Uh, and as I keep saying, you need uh, someone who believes in this to run the show. 
uh, in communities because you cannot uh, expect uh, you know any enforcement uh, to scale up to a city city uh, you know wide uh, program uh, though the municipality tries its best but i don't think uh, it's possible so we need uh, people to take that individual action uh, stay connected uh, to the cause itself that waste is such a humongous problem and uh, see the uh, you know where where because a lot of people ask me these questions like uh, you know about food itself you know if you buy organic food it's very expensive so the only question i ask them is uh, uh, check out why is the other food so cheap you know you get all your answers there i don't even have to explain to you uh, so pe- people uh, you know there's a lack of uh, you know proper understanding of this whole thing about you know what waste is doing how much of your waste can regenerate soil you know and what comes off the soil should be from a living soil you know which is rich in nutrients and pandemic has thrown up one thing that we are all so low on immunity you know it shows that nutrition is so lacking in the entire population of this planet it's because we have moved to be processed food you know food which is devoid of any uh, you know nutrients you know which comes from natural soil so there's such a disconnect in everything you know the cycle has not been completed anywhere so uh, i think the more and more awareness is the key uh, awareness taken by people who really believe in 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 in, in this uh, you know in this kind of uh, uh, living you know it, it being minimalist in your own way trying to be lifestyle changes that make you feel so proud you know to be a part of this beautiful planet that gives us everything that we need you know the air the water the soil to grow our food is only this is the only planet that gives us and what is the gratitude you 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 give you want to trash it you want to pollute it so i think constantly it should be reminding the planet when you look outside you should be reminding am i positively contributing to this beautiful world or in what way am i stressing her or you know leaving her polluted these are questions that needs to be asked by everybody and we need campaigns to take this across you know again i feel there'll be more people who will uh, want to take that make that choice because it is individual choice as well you know it, it can't be something that trended for some time and then it's gone uh, you know we need to sustain it for the rest of our lives yeah and uh, thank you so much you know for having me it was lovely uh, listening to manoj and, uh, and the amazing work they have done there and uh, thank you shruti and for all that you've been and uh, you've been doing and uh, it's an honor to be on this platform. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It has been a real, you know, session of learning for me. Um Manoj, thank you also for being here today, sharing with us your journey. Um a lot of new things that I I didn't know about that I've learned today and um and this really it you know, it's such a beautiful ending to the week of dialogues that we've been having, you know, in which we've spoken, we've touched upon a variety of topics you know Ronnie earlier in the week we also spoke to Sarah Edwards and she spoke about the nutritional value of having whole foods right just you know natural foods and things like that and how that influences your health and and so on and so forth so it's been you know thank you so much uh for being here thank you shruti uh, i just want to say one of the gifts today is to know of the extraordinary work of vani ji and to say that uh, my team from the urban farms co which is another venture which is growing vegetables in cities using compost um i will connect them especially the bangalore team in fact the national leader is a bangalore boy so i'll ask vikash abraham to meet but i think shruti it should it's important to for me to also highlight as i sign off like uh, tamara uh, which is like you are in the center of sustainability i mean that's that's your core purpose which is so inspiring and we feel close to it what i'm liking is a trend that is becoming globally now relevant which is for companies to plant trees because it is a best way to offset carbon it's the best way to sequester carbon the 31 million trees for example that we have planted more almost half has been done by the mahindra group and the remaining half i would say a lot from companies in europe uh, mm-hmm. all of them are excited about the potential of saving the planet through carbon sequestration and carbon offsets so i think we are at a tipping point if we can have more such dialogues we can have more conversations and talk time on this composting soil trees biodiversity food nutrition i think we should be known to be 
people who were part of not COVID generation, but food generation. We should be the food people. Let's hope that happens. But thank you so much for this wonderful um, initiative. And I, I hope one day to come and check out Tamara. Please do. I'm, I know. Here. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, for us, you know, these dialogues also one thing about them is that we were really trying to connect people from sort of all of these different areas to come together and collaborate really, you know, find common area, common grounds for collaboration. I think that really is the future, right? Because if we all sort of, we all have a lot of subject matter knowledge. I mean, there are a lot of experts actually that we've been speaking to and they all are amazing, but imagine the power that we could have together as a community coming together and sort of bringing all those little pieces, um, you know, back and forth. And so I, I, you know, thank you so much for being a part of this. We will continue to have these sorts of dialogues um, in coming months and years. Everyone who has been a part of these dialogues over the last few days and today, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for some of the great questions and the contributions that you've given to us. Um, I'd also like to thank my team. I think as both of you mentioned, we are nothing without our teams and I am certainly nothing without my team. So incredibly grateful for my team, your teams, everyone who helped um, to put this, uh, this session together. Um, and yeah, and I look forward to seeing everyone at more events like this in the future. Thank you so much again. Happy World Environment Day and take thank care. You.